Ms. Bonnie Dugal, who is the uh, principal representative of the Baha'i community at the United Nations here. As part of the community of international NGOs at the UN, she has served as the president of the NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion or Belief. She's also served as co-facilitator of the NGO Working Group on UN Access and of the GEAR campaign, which is Gender Equality Architecture Reform, and is part and is past chair of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. I thank her very much, Ms. Dugal. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Pamela. I'm going to um, focus on some of the challenges and uh, the crises that um, um, religious minorities face. But um, despite its uh, centrality to human well-being and development, freedom of religion or belief is often ignored, overlooked, or relegated to a second tier of uh, rights by the international community and human rights bodies. And so it's for that reason I am truly um, grateful to um, the missions of Italy and Jordan and also um, Canada, Netherlands, and Senegal who had an excellent ev event on this subject yesterday for focusing on this very important issue. These rights of uh, freedom of religion or belief, which are enshrined in the Universal Declaration, are often tested in relation to minority rights and religious minorities in particular. Initially, the uh, UN rejected the idea of minority rights. The thinking was that universal rights would be the panacea for all, and that the call for equality eliminated the ne necessity of singling out particular categories of rights holders. And um, after a number of decades, they realized that the equal treatment could actually re realize in discrimination of, of those who are lower down on the pecking order. So uh, superficial equality can fail to cure discrimination against those that had uh, previously been unequal. It merely conceals, conceals that inequality with the gloss of this equal treatment. So, and religious minorities are especially vulnerable, and states need to therefore have programs that nurture and protect them. Some uh, current and future challenges, and I'm just going to list them because of the uh, t time that's short. The widening gap between commitments and implementation. Despite repeated commitments on the part of governments to uphold the right, uh, we are seeing today a widening gap between their, um, their commitments and their promises. And uh, state interference and suppression of the rights of religious minority failure on the parts of states to foster harmonious relations, and the state not realizing the benefits of the diversity and the contributions its religious minorities make to society. The challenge to the right to change religion and convert, this has been uh, talked about um, earlier today, so I'm not going to uh, stress it even though we have an excellent report by uh, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief on this subject, and I urge you all to attend the uh, interactive dialogue uh, next month. Uh, the right to manifest and teach religion or beliefs. Among the activities encompassed by the freedom of religion or belief, the freedom to manifest and teach beliefs has been particularly contentious. So it's both uh, the U Universal Declaration talks about the internal right, but I'm uh, talking about the manifestation of those beliefs, which is the external right. And governments are granted the latitude to restrict this right for purposes of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, etc. However, we can also argue that marginalizing religious minorities frequently results in exclusion and division, which can lead to actions which actually disrupt public order, as we've seen recently. No society is perfect, but the freedoms enjoyed in pluralistic societies in which diversity of religion or belief is protected and coupled with the rule of law provide a much more stable foundation for peaceful relations between members of different religions and positive dynamics in society at large. While they are far from perfect, I must share the examples of the land of my birth and that of my adopted country, uh, India and the U.S., which provide examples of pluralistic societies in which these freedoms are protected by the state. 
However, the state could be doing much more to protect and promote harmonious relations between the different groups. Conversely, when governments actively suppress or re repress these freedoms, they marginalize religious communities, exacerbate misunderstandings, and the propagation of harmful uh, stereotypes. It's been well established that the repression of freedom of religion or belief leads to political and social instability. And uh, a case in point would be the situation of the Baha'i community in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is state-sponsored uh, persecution. Uh, another challenge today, and in fact we'll possibly see more of it as women advance, is the, this issue of uh, the women's right to freedom of religion or belief. Women's rights have an important place at the UN um, human rights norms and standards. However, women's right of religion has been largely ignored by the international and human rights community. And the past 56 sessions of the Commission on Status of Women have never addressed this issue. And uh, there's no mention of uh, religion or belief in the CEDAW Convention, even though the committee itself has focused quite a bit on this issue. Uh, to conclude, I'd say the manner in which a state treats its minorities could be a standard by which to measure the status of human rights in any country. At the heart of this issue must be the understanding of the relationship between all members of the human family, and to restrict freedom of religion or belief to one group of individuals is to deny the entire human family the spiritual, social, and intellectual benefits that derive from this freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, before